year's Milken Conference continues in person in L.A., bringing together heavyweights across industries, including companies like GM. We take you there live with Andy Serwer, Yahoo Finance Editor-in-Chief at the Milken Conference. Andy? That's right, Brad. I'm here with Mary Barra, CEO of General Motors. Mary, so great to see you. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Good to be here. You just announced earnings last week, a nice, solid, strong quarter. How much of that had to do with raising prices and what you're able to get in your showrooms, and what should consumers expect going forward with pricing? Well, you know, we still are seeing some constraints in products. So frankly, right now, the demand for our products, and we have some new uh, products coming out right now, like the, the next uh, generation of our uh, Silverado, our Chevy Silverado, and our GMC Sierra. So we're seeing really strong demand. Uh, I think people are going to continue to see that uh, there, you know, there's not a huge availability of vehicles. And that is, uh, you know, leading to stronger pricing. But uh, we also think there's value there with the new innovation on these vehicles. I do want to talk about your product line because it's really exciting all the changes that you're making in the new vehicles, but I do want to ask you a little bit about supply chain. Sure. Everyone's heard about the chip shortage, Mary. How is that affecting what you're able to do? Well, it still is having an impact. Uh, you know, what we see is kind of quarter after quarter, it gets better, but, you know, I think it will last into 2023. We're changing the way we do semiconductors, so over the longer term, we plan on having a uh, Fewer versions of semiconductors. We're going to standardize on three families. But for right now, you know, we're working through the constraints, and I have to give a, a big shout out to our supply chain team. They do a phenomenal job. Another headwind, uh, particularly from the consumer front, is higher interest rates. And I'm wondering how you're considering that, factoring that in in terms of demand from the consumer side. Well, you know, interest rates is something we watch very, very carefully. Uh, and again, though, right now, though, I think the demand for our products is outweighing that. Generally, people might make a different decision on, you know, what features and uh, functionality they get on the vehicle, but it really hasn't impacted demand, so it's something we continue to watch. And what about the model with the car dealers? Um, you know, obviously there are others at her doing DTC. That's a big buzzword this th these days. Um, are you considering going direct to consumer and what is your thinking on that? Well, I really think over the long term, our dealers are a strategic asset. I, you know, they have the relationship in the community with the customers, and our our offering is going to be: What does the customer want? If they want to buy the vehicle completely online and have it delivered to their home, that's an option. If they want to go into the dealership and literally kick the tires, they can do that too. But we've dramatically changed the process. You know, that was one of the the silver linings out of COVID that we uh, really accelerated our uh, online shopping experience. Experience. So we're going to meet the customer where they are. And in terms of getting back to normalcy with regard to COVID in terms of your workforce, mm -hmm. in terms of being able to operate your plants and facilities, where do things stand right now, Mary? Well, you know, I have to just say, you know, across the globe, so many of our people who need to be at work to do their work, they stepped up, they followed our safety protocols so they could safely uh, come back to work, and uh, they continue to do that. Now, as we're getting to the point for those who can work from home, uh, they're starting to come back, but our, our uh, practice there, we call it work appropriately. And it's not, I want you in the office, or I don't want to be in the office, it's where can you do your best work? And that kind of flexibility is, I think, what we need to offer today's uh, today's workforce where we can. And, and we're seeing that, we're in early days. I've also told them, look, we're going to start and we're going to learn and we'll adapt as we go. But the assembly plants, full bore now? Oh, you know, uh, back in 2020, about five or six weeks after, for instance, the U.S. Uh, shut down, our people came back and they came back in mass. They followed the protocols. I mean, the only time we've had downtime is more for part shortages, not because of the team. So again, uh, really uh, a, a strong performance and commitment by our GM team members. All right, let's talk about some of those new vehicles. But I want to want to start actually with the core of the business, which is what you're doing with batteries. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge endeavor and part of your strategy going forward. So let's take some time and really drill down into how that works. Absolutely, well, and you're absolutely right. For electric vehicles, it's all about the battery. And that's why we've done two major things. First, about four years ago, we recognized, because of our experience with uh, the Volt, the Chevrolet Volt and the Chevrolet Bolt, we knew we needed a dedicated architecture for EVs, one that was scalable, and also one that uh, 
uh, would give us the speed to roll out a whole portfolio of electric vehicles. Because again, when you're looking to get to 50% of what you sell all the way to 100 by 2035, you need to have a portfolio of electric vehicles. So we started launching the Ultium platform in uh, last at the end of last year with the GMC Hummer EV. It's also now being launched with the Cadillac Lyric that's coming out of Spring Hill, Tennessee. And you'll continue to see more and more vehicles like the Chevy Silverado early next year, the Chevrolet Equinox, and the Chevrolet Blazer, and there's even more coming than that that we haven't released yet. And so what's key though is we also looked at this pivot to EVs and we really assessed our supply chain. And we decided that we wanted to have control over battery cell manufacture. So we formed a joint venture with LG, uh, one of our partners, and we now have a, a plant coming online this year in Ohio, another one coming online next year, the following year, and one after that. So this is really a, a significant change in bringing this work to the United States, creating job and also having more control over the, the chemistry, the technology, and also just the actual ability to, uh, to make our own uh, battery cells so we can meet uh, the acceleration plan we have for EVs. I have so many follow-up questions on that. I mean, <laughs> how many jobs, for instance, do you anticipate creating with these new battery plants in the United States? Well, roughly every battery plant is around uh, 1,100 to 1,200 people. So if you think about that, four plants alone, and we're not done yet, uh, that's a significant job creation. And these manufacturing uh, facilities, it's probably more expensive to have them in the United States, but you have the trade-off with the safety of supply chain? Well, safety of supply chain, but also logistics. And so when you think about the logistics piece of it, having it close to where we're actually building the vehicle or, or assembling the battery pack is an advantage. And so these batteries, they're basically, you know, with your partner LG, they're specific, they're going to be used specifically in GM vehicles. They're different from other manufacturers. I mean, are they ever going to be compatible? Is it ever going to be the case that batteries would be compatible across different manufacturers? Sure, well, you know, when we look at the way we designed the Ultium platform for our electric vehicles, we one, wanted it to be chemistry agnostic because we yeah. knew there was going to be advancements in chemistry that would improve energy density, range, et cetera, of the, of the battery performance. But we also recognized there'd be different cells. So whether it's prismatic, pouch, or cylindrical cells, the Ultium platform can accommodate all of that. So we are working with not only LG, but many other partners uh, and doing our work internally on, on battery cell chemistry. But we also recognize you know, the breakthrough technology could come from anywhere. And that's why we uh, spent the time to put the flexibility into our Ultium platform, really focused on doing it right for the long term. Listening to you, I'm reminded that you studied as an electrical engineer, so um, got some good background there from an education <laughs> standpoint. And, and so some of the components and the elements though come from, nickel comes from Russia and you have to source still from overseas. What are some of the challenges there when it comes to batteries? Well, in the short term, we feel that we've got uh, the supply arrangements in place, so we're going to be able to meet our ramp. But going forward, we're also looking to make sure more of this supply chain is in North America or in or with strong trading partners like Australia. So we've been uh, announcing several arrangements with suppliers, not only to have the capacity between now and 2025, but 25 and beyond. And uh, you know, I'm very pleased with where we're at. We have a few more. Uh, uh, materials to secure, but we're on it. Let's talk about some of the vehicles now. I mean, and you know, we're talking about America, we're talking about pickup trucks. It's going to be a dogfight. Silverado is going to be ready to go though, right? Talk to us about Silverado. Absolutely, well the Silverado will be uh, rolling off assembly lines in, in less than 11 months. And this is a truck with no compromises from uh, 400 miles of range, faster, fast charging, uh, you know, the, the flexibility of the bed uh, with the multi-pro tailgate, as well as the, the ability to reconfigure the cab. It's got more storage. And so it's a, it's a truck with no compromises. And as we share the details with our dealers and with customers, they are, uh, you know, it's a truck worth the wait. And right. not to mention, we already have the GMC Hummer out right now, and um, it is a true super truck. Turning radius, um, you know, the, the power of the vehicle. And so when we look at all the best features of the Hummer, many of those are going to be on the Silverado as well. And then not too long after the Silverado launches, we'll also have the GMC. So we're going to have a portfolio of trucks, because what we've seen in the market is Truck buyers, there's a lot of people who are now truck buyers, from those who need it for their livelihood to people who just want to drive a truck because it's cool. 
And you do have the Tesla and the Ford coming out and mm -hmm. Rivian as well. Um, how do you anticipate that competitive landscape? Well, you know, General Motors has sold more trucks uh, collectively than anyone for several years now. And so with our, our strong performance uh, and our knowledge of truck customers, we feel very well positioned to offer uh, choices in the truck market to meet the customer what they want. Psychologically, I mean, there is an element that's very macho for trucks, right? You talked about a lot of different buyers of trucks, of course, right. but there is this, the American you know, frontier, you see the commercials, right? <laughs> I mean, are, is it really going to be the case that these guys are going to be comfortable driving electric pickup trucks? Uh, you know, I'm driving a Hummer EV right now, and uh, as well as I'm driving a Bolt. One of the best parts of my jobs is I get to drive a lot of vehicles. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the Hummer EV, um, it is just, it, you know, the turning radius, uh, the instant acceleration, the capability, whether you need towing or payload, it's going to be there. So yes, they are going to be buying electric trucks. And so the Hummer is available right now? Yes, okay. yes. And, and these, by the way, are all electric, they're not hybrids. All electric. We strategically made the decision of why go halfway to the solution with a hybrid, but go all the way and get to the end game, and that's one of the reasons we're going to be able to have a full portfolio out faster than most of our competitors because of that investment, because we didn't, didn't do hybrids. Customers kind of said, I'm not interested in a hybrid because I, you know, I don't want to pay for two propulsion systems on the vehicle. This is a thing for all auto manufacturers. When are you going to be all electric or all mostly electric? What is GM's benchmark there? So in the United States, GM has said, and our plan is that we will be all electric with our light duty vehicles by 2035. We're the only one with a full portfolio who's made that commitment. And then we think the solution for heavy duty vehicles is fuel cells. And we have the hydrotech, te hydrotech technology that will be implemented there. So we're moving aggressively to move to that all future. And is that hydrogen? I'm sorry. Well, it, uh, for our light duty vehicles, it will be battery electric. Right. We believe the solution for heavy duty vehicles and beyond and other applications for stationary power is fuel cells. How do you even have a strategic plan in your mind and with the board and with senior management with this amazing revolution going on in your business? Well, you know, I have a phen phenomenal board and they have been very, very um, involved in setting out the strategic course and encouraging us to go fast and get to the end game technology and make sure we do it in a way that we're going to grow shares. So what it represents for General Motors is tremendous growth potential, not only in electric vehicles, also in autonomous vehicles, and then the services that sit on top of the vehicle because the vehicle really is now a software-defined platform. And when is the when are the lines going to cross, Mary, for the overall uh, auto market in the U.S. between uh, electric and internal combustion engines? Well, for General Motors, we're targeting by 2030, yeah. so five years before our goal to be 100%, that we're you know, going to be approaching 50% of our vehicles. I think we're going to be on the leading end there, but I would say you know, around the end of the decade, you're going to start to see it become, you know, become a race to what's, what's going to be greater than 50%. Mary Barra, CEO of GM, thanks so much for joining us. High inflation continues to hit food prices and in turn the food banks that offer assistance to struggling households. I'm joined by Katie Fitzgerald, Feeding America's COO and president for more on this. Thank you for joining me. So first off, um, let us know what you're hearing from some of these food banks and organizations that you work with about the demand that you're seeing now. Yeah, thank you, Rochelle, so much for having me. I wish I could say that we're seeing um, a leveling out as we hope the pandemic itself is leveling out, but what we're seeing is a continuation of a perfect storm scenario that we've been dealing with since the start of this pandemic. It's just that the forces have sort of shifted. So on one hand, uh, increases in demand that are being brought about by the increased food prices that are applying a lot of pressure on families and especially on the budgets of low-income households where a third of their budget uh, is, is spent on food. So the combination of fuel prices, food prices, frankly, is, is we fear pushing more people into food insecurity. And we had 38 million people facing food insecurity in the US before these prices went up. And then for food banks, we're seeing uh, the same pressures applying where those costs of purchasing food, which we've had to come to rely on to meet this elevated need, as well as other um, critical 
uh, challenges in the supply chain continue that are making it really hard for us to meet the need right now that we're seeing in communities. And it's incredibly sad. I mean, I know that just this past weekend, I saw very long lines at food banks and churches that were giving out food lines that I hadn't seen since the peak of the pandemic. So how would you compare that, though, in terms of what we saw that that was more job loss driven and illness driven versus what we're seeing now? How much of that is purely inflation versus perhaps a hangover from COVID? You know, we've never really seen demand go back to pre-pandemic levels in terms of the level of food insecurity in this country. It did come down from its height during the sort of height of the, the closure of the economy during the pandemic, but it has been at an elevated level. And so what we're seeing now, we think is driven largely by these impossible choices people are having to make um, between food, as your prior guest uh, was talking about, food and medicine and fuel, um, just trying to stretch their dollar. For food banks, they've had to rely on food purchasing. And there we know that we're paying about 40% more for the food that our network is purchasing. And what a lot of folks don't understand is when we get donated food, which is down in our network, we still have to pay the fuel and freight costs to move that food from point A to point B. And so this combined impact of increased demand and the increased cost of doing business is continuing to make this a real struggle for the Feeding America network of food banks. And food insecurity obviously existed before the pandemic, before the surge in inflation, but how have these added pressures impacted the demographics of who's actually in need of food assistance? Yeah, so what's really troubling about what we're seeing in uh, food insecurity in this country is that there were disparities uh, among different populations in this country before the pandemic, where uh, black households were almost two and a half times more likely than white, white households to be experiencing food insecurity, uh, Latin households about two times more likely. What we've seen through the pandemic is those disparities and gaps have only grown. And so we're very concerned that we're continuing to be in a position where rather than closing gaps among various demographics in the country around food and sec food security, we're seeing those gaps uh, widen. And that's why we and the Feeding America Network are working very hard to not only meet all the needs in our community, but really reach out to those communities most disproportionately impacted and help make sure that they're able to access the nutritious food that they need. And as you mentioned there, 38 million people, including nearly 12 million children, living in food insecure households in the US. Now, how is that defined so that people understand the framework around this? And what are some of the strat strategies that have at least tried to reduce that? Yeah, so the, those numbers come from the USDA's food insecurity um, survey that is done every two years. And as I indicated earlier, those numbers came out before we saw these inflationary pressures really. Um, wrecking havoc. And so we believe that we're likely experiencing higher rates of food insecurity than what the 38 million and 12 million children numbers would indicate. One other in critical um, role that is necessary to be played here to address food insecurity in the United States is the role of government. So Congress uh, uh, takes critical action, can take more action to invest in something called the Emergency Food Assistance Program that allows for uh, the USDA to purchase food from American growers and move that food into the charitable food system that the Feeding America Network of Food Banks largely distribute to, to folks in need. The other thing is that the USDA um, is working very hard and we work very closely with them and are encouraging them to use every one of their purchasing muscles to get more food purchased and out into the charitable food system so that we really can close this gap. Because right now we're seeing a at the same time, demand is up and the private sector is sort of struggling to keep up with that demand. Uh, we're seeing USDA commodity food available in our network down about 40%. So again, we have this situation where we're, we're really struggling to meet the demand that's there. And when you think of the input cost in the supply chain, whether it's farmers paying more for feed and fertilizer, then you have the truck driver shortages, grocery stores then putting up prices, some say keeping them inflated, in other cases they're saying that they're trying to just keep pace with inflation. By the time it reaches a consumer or a food bank, what sort of markup is there? Oh, you know, we again, our, our numbers indicate we, we went from paying 50 cents per pound uh, through our 
a sort of collective purchasing program to now we're paying about 70 cents a pound uh, for the food that we're purchasing for the network. And then we've seen, depending on the commodity out in communities all across the country where our food banks serve, uh, uh, purchase or products that are, you know, two, three, four times the, so the price that they were uh, before these inflationary pressures came to bear. So we're seeing um, quite significant increases in prices, which again, prior to the pandemic, the Feeding America Network of Food Banks really didn't purchase much food at all to meet the need that we have. We, we really um, work off of a model that's uh, collecting food that's available from the food supply chain and bringing that good food to folks who can benefit from it. We now have to rely on purchasing that food and that's not a sustainable um, situation for us, especially at these prices. A big beat for Moderna in the first quarter. Earnings per share and revenue blew past Wall Street estimates from the beginning of the year. Joining us to dive more into these numbers is Moderna CEO Stefan Bonsell. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani joins me as well. Stefan, thank you for being here. Um, let's talk about that beat, first of all, and where it came from. Um, when we're talking about the, the earnings per share beat, it's in particular large. I know you guys did some stock buybacks, which may have accounted for some of that beat. What else? What, what else drove the growth in the quarter? Well, good morning and thank you for having me. Well, I think first is strong sales. If you look at the sales compared to last year, we've increased the sale by 3x, 6.1 billion. Last year, 1.9 billion for Q1. And then I think also the operational leverage that we have on volume. You know, uh, Mona is a pretty efficient company. You know, we started as we built it to be very digital across the board, very industrialized. So as we get more volume, we get a lot of economies of scale. We're able to increase, you know, uh, net income by 3x as well. The the share reduction helped a little bit, but we're talking, you know, 5 million shares out of 400 million shares. So what is good is in Q4 and Q1, we're starting to reduce the float of a company, which means every investor owns a bigger chunk of our future cash flows, which is great. Uh, but it was not driven by the, the, the really the share count. Um, and I don't believe you came out with any earnings guidance for the full year, but can you tell me broadly if investors should expect that same sort of growth for the full year? So we didn't give precise guidance, you know, because none of us has managed the transition from a pandemic to an endemic setting um, for obvious reasons. And But what we gave is kind of a framework, which is we confirmed this morning that we have uh, signed advanced purchase agreements with governments around the world for $21 billion. And then David, our CFO, went and kind of described in terms of investment in R&D, which we think will be around $4 billion this year and tax rate and so on, how people should think about modeling the year. Um, what is interesting is in this $21 billion signed APAs, there is nothing for the US. And the reason is very simple. Those are signed contracts, as you're highly aware there's currently no funding from Congress to buy more vaccines for the fall. So the US government is not able to buy vaccines now. What we are doing as a company is we're, of course, getting ready, assuming there is no contract. If there's a contract, it will be kind of easy. We will sell the product to the US government like in the last two years, and people will have access to the product in their local pharmacies like we have today. But if this doesn't happen, we're getting the company ready to be fully commercial. This might actually provide some upside, not only on sales, because there's zero sales assumed in 21 billion, but also on pricing. CMS uh, has basically come up saying that for fiscal year 23, which starts in October, the price for COVID-19 vaccine should be around $60. Uh, as it's public information, the price that the US government paid in the last two years was 16.5. So you could see there's some upside there as well. Uh, Stefan, on that specific point, because you don't necessarily have the agreement right now, do you have any signal from the U.S. government or the FDA to sort of plan for boosters? And if so, uh, what do you see as sort of the need for the fall? So in our discussion with the U.S. government from, you know, the different you know, agencies, CDC, FDA, HHS and so on, uh, it is very clear that people believe, like we do, that because of waning immunity, and because of new variants emerging and being more and more infectious, it's going to be critical to protect people in the fall and winter that the vaccines are not going to help uh, efficacy-wise for people who got boosted, you know, 
last November or December or January. Uh, and so they believe there needs to be a new booster. And they also believe that what we have as an Omicron containing booster, which is a bivalent, so there's two mRNA in the vaccine being tested in the clinic, which we should have the data for in June, hoping for an authorization in the August time frame to be able to stock the channel. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. It's really a problem of funding, not of desire of getting the product. And so we're just getting ready uh, so that Americans can have access to vaccine in case of the U.S. government not getting funding. So right now you're operating as if the U.S. government is not going to fund. Do you anticipate that that will come through, though? I think it will come through. But again, given uh, <laughs> I'm not in control of what happened in Congress, uh, I just need to be ready for the alternative, which is we have to go to a typical, what every pharmaceutical product does, private market, and we'll be ready for this. We're having a lot of discussion with world sellers uh, to, to make sure that we have all the PCs contracting and so on to be able to operate like a normal pharmaceutical company. Stefan, let's talk about not just um, the, the um, variant that you're developing to attack Omicron, but also for younger children, because we know that you're uh, putting in your application for an EUA for the youngest cohort. We've really become accustomed to the FDA being very speedy when it comes to uh, vaccines for COVID-19. Do you think they're now dragging their feet on these these sort of latest versions or the the uh, the vaccine for children. So I don't think the FDA is dragging their feet. Uh, at least the people we interact with, you know, are working really hard uh, to help protect American people, like we have seen you know, happening over the last two years. I think what the FDA is on the record saying is that they want to review the Moderna and the vaccine, uh, sorry, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine at the same time for the pediatric setting. And uh, to the best of my information, Pfizer has not yet shared publicly the data with a third dose. You might recall they tried with two doses for pediatric. It didn't seem to be enough. And so they are trying with a third dose out of the gate. So that would be a free dose, a, a primary series to start protecting young children. We have shared data with two doses, which we believe uh, is, is a very strong vaccine. Our dose is higher than Pfizer. You remember this is the case for every product. The primary series in early 2021 was higher than Pfizer. The booster is almost 2x the Pfizer dose. So our dose, even for children, even if it's lower versus adults, is higher than Pfizer. So we believe our two-dose vaccine will work, and we believe a lot of parents, if authorized by the FDA, will like the idea of only getting two shots in their children versus three shots. Stefan, uh, for looking at, um, you know, out in the fall, the future, you're talking about waning immunity. And of course, there's still a little bit of uncertainty for the U.S. government. Do you anticipate that because of this waning immunity, we could see the surge then be impactful enough that maybe we have to put in more restrictions and go back to limited offices? That's the risk we all have in the fall, which is if you think about it, this virus is not getting less infectious. The way biology works and evolution works is only one way, is more infection. And so as you see more and more infectious variants, and you see now the BF4 and the BF5, and you're going to keep seeing more, we're not done with this virus mutating. Uh, so on the one hand, you're going to have more and more uh, infectious virus, and on the other hand, you're going to have waning immunity. And so as you described, the biggest risk we have in the fall is that if people don't get boosted, you're going to get a lot of people sick. And if you get a lot of people sick, those that are at highest risk will get hospitalized. And this is where you get, again, too many people in the hospital and we go at it again. So I think we have a risk in the fall that if we don't have the booster uh, campaign under control and do it early enough, that we might be in a not great spot in the fall. Well, hopefully you're wrong, but you probably know a lot better than I do. Thanks so much, Stefan, for being here. It's good to catch up with you. Moderna CEO Stefan Bansell and our Anjali Kemlani. Burger King sales are still lukewarm in the U.S., but the brand is delivering whopper-sized gains overseas as key markets recover from the depths of the pandemic. Sprinkle in another comeback quarter for coffee chain Tim Hortons, and you have the better-than-expected performance from restaurant brands seen in the first quarter. Restaurant brand CEO Jose Sill joins us now. Jose, good to see you as always. Let's start on Burger King overseas. Why is the brand hot over there? Hey, Brian, great to see you. Great to see the whole team. Um, yeah, Burger King internationally has been doing fantastically well. We had a, a really good quarter uh, this first quarter. Uh, what we've seen is, is strong performance across all of our regions, Europe, uh, Middle East, Africa, Asia as well, and, and Latin America picking up quite a bit. And, and what's happening to, to kind of uh, simplify for, for everyone, 
Uh, we, we've got really good, our teams are, are doing a good job on, on the marketing plans, on the menu innovation. Uh, digital has been a really big uh, driver of growth. And, and during the pandemic, we saw uh, an increase in our off-premise capabilities and, and our business. So drive-throughs, delivery, uh, digital rewards, uh, loyalty, this is all uh, quite strong during the pandemic. That's stuck. Um, and, and what we've seen uh, come back quite a bit with easing of restrictions and, and mobility picking up is, is the on-premise business. So dine-in uh, getting stronger. And so the combination of the two uh, has has uh, driven really significant growth that tw uh, plus 20 percent uh, for the international business in same store sales and uh, and north of 30 percent from a system wide sales standpoint. So exciting momentum in an international business. I'd say a little bit of change of tone, uh, Jose, on, on Burger King in the U.S. from from you and the team. You noted uh, you are chipping away at competition at Burger King in the U.S. What are you doing specifically to take the fight to McDonald's and other brands? Yeah, so that, that was, it, look, it's not a victory lap. Um, for, for us, growth and, uh, and leading the industry is, uh, is the goal. We want to create gaps, not, not close them, but, but it's a starting point of, uh, of the turn. And that's why I, did, I thought it was important to share that uh, yesterday at, at earnings that, that we're making progress. We made progress in the fourth quarter uh, and continue to make progress here in the first quarter of 22. And, and what we're doing is we're, we're really focusing on, on the core iconic uh, flagship product of, of Burger King, which is the Whopper. We removed it from our uh, uh, core discount platform, the two for six. We brought in uh, new items into that uh, platform, reduced the price to two for five, uh, and then you know really highlighted the, the Whopper uh, as as it should be as a as a core iconic flagship product of, of Burger King. We also brought in Whopper melts, and and are limiting our messaging uh, to to fewer but more impactful uh, messages and promotions. And so that, that's just the starting point. We've also uh, gone through an agency review. And made changes on our creative agency uh, and, and others as well, and and we think over time uh, the the menu work, the marketing work, uh, the communication work, and brand work will be a, a key driver of growth. In addition to operations, our digital uh, improvements, and and some of the work we're doing on image. Within the work on Popeyes Louisiana Kitchen, noticing particularly that there's a little bit of a deceleration in the growth there. It, the chicken sandwich wars we had seen that of course generate a ton of fanfare, go viral. Are we seeing that start to decline and pull back a little bit? And what does that mean in terms of the investments within that brand too? Yeah, the Pop Popeyes has had a great run uh, for quite some time. We shared uh, yesterday that uh, since the acquisition in 2017, we've uh, we've added nearly 50% or just over 50% system-wide sales. Uh, unit growth has been tremendously strong and top line and, and unit economics have improved tremendously. And, and in fact, the first quarter of, uh, of 2022 was the strongest quarter ever for the uh, or the strongest start to the year ever for the Popeyes brand uh, in, the, in the US from a development standpoint. That said, we did have some headwinds from a sales, same sort of sales standpoint. And, and part of it uh, has been, as I've mentioned, we've had some challenges from a, a staffing standpoint. Hours of operation have been somewhat impacted. We're, we're getting a little bit better on that. Uh, and our franchisees are doing a good job of, uh, of continuing to, to staff their restaurants and, and be open more hours uh, to, to drive uh, and address more consumer demands. Uh, the other piece is there's been a lot of competition uh, coming over the last year uh, on the chicken sandwich side uh, from uh, chicken players as well as uh, uh, broader QSR players. Uh, we think we have the uh, best in class product, not, not because I say it, but because our, our consumers say it. And we, we, uh, this week we launched the, uh, the Buffalo Ranch chicken sandwich to, uh, to remind folks how great the Popeye's chicken sandwich is. And we're excited about the, the start of that promotion. Hey, Jose, it's Julie. I want to ask you a little bit more about the staffing issue. I mean, we just heard from Starbucks and Howard Schultz, who is the interim CEO, talking about $17 an hour in average pay. Now, I know the majority of your restaurants are franchisees. They're not owned, so you don't have as much control over what they're paying folks. But what are you seeing out there in terms of pay? How much is it going up? What is the average pay? And, and how are they attracting and retaining people to keep those Popeyes open as, as much and as long as possible? Well, we, we've seen increases in um, in wages really throughout the country. It's the same uh, here in Canada, uh, which is where I'm at today. Um, and, and so I, I think that there's there's a balanced approach here for uh, for improving uh, staffing and, and hours of operation. I, I think the key is is ensuring you have uh, a really good uh, employee value proposition, and it's one of the things we're working with our our owners uh, across the U.S. Our, our franchisees are coming together with our teams and building. Uh, and sharing best practices and building game plans uh, based on, on on things they're doing in their restaurants to to hire better to have, you know, the the right level of uh, of benefits for 
uh, for their employees uh, to create the right um, culture in their restaurants and, and the combination of, of salary, wages plus benefits plus uh, the right environment and the right culture. These are things that attract people to store to restaurants and these are things that uh, help folks uh, you know, retain talent and, and, and hopefully start growing uh, their business that way. So we're, it's a full uh, uh, core press in terms of being able to, to drive the right environment in the restaurants and, and our franchisees are doing a good job. And, and we think over time, we'll be able to, uh, to address this and, and continue to grow the business uh, through, through better staffing and better hours of operation. Jose, Julia briefly mentioned Starbucks and, and they came out last night and they, and they said, we're gonna open up a lot more drive throughs that, That's your turf. Uh, and the turf of your rivals. Uh, how do you think about Starbucks as a competitor and, and because of their impending arrival even more into the drive through do you see yourself making a bigger play in coffee? Look, everybody's a competitor uh, in, in my vantage point, right? If, if you're not part of the RBI family, you're a competitor and, and uh, certainly drive throughs uh, we've seen in the US and in Canada and throughout the globe uh, have become uh, that much more important in light of uh, of the off-premise uh, growth in, in, in the business through digital and also th through the pandemic uh, over the last 24 months. Uh, we have a, a really strong and, and you know, ubiquitous presence in, in the U.S. Uh, with drive throughs at Burger King, uh, Popeyes is growing. Uh, with Tim Hortons, we have over 650 uh, locations. We're one of the largest coffee chains in, in the country. We think we can be uh, bigger. We've created a new platform uh, for Tim's uh, here in the U.S. from a drive through standpoint. So we, we've got uh, our own growth plans uh, for for all three brands and Firehouse as well. We've added uh, drive-throughs as well for Firehouse. There's about 50 or 60 of them uh, in the U.S. that have uh, that have drive-throughs. So it, it's a strong and important part of the business. Um, it's something that we do quite well. Our franchisees are, are really capable at that in terms of finding locations and and developing drive-through locations throughout the country, and and we'll continue to grow uh, using that platform and many others as well. Well, as you know, just like uh, Justin Bieber, I am very much a Timbits fan. We'll leave it there. Restaurant Brands CEO Jose Sill, always good to get some time with you. We'll talk to you soon. It's an expensive weekend in Miami, indeed, in the city's famous nightclub. 11 is revving up for the big weekend. The club kicked off celebrations last night. Rick Ross was the first performer. Diplo is going to be tonight. Snoop Dogg, Travis Scott, Tiesto, all scheduled to perform over the coming days. But if you want to get a table at 11, you better be able to pay these big bucks. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars, over $100,000 I read for some of these tables. Let's talk about what's going on there. Live from Miami, we want to bring in Gino Lapinto. He's the operating partner of 11. Gino, it's great to have you. It's an expensive weekend in Miami. Give us a sense just of what it's like on the ground and how does this compare to the Super Bowl that Miami hosted just two years ago? It's funny that you say that because that was our greatest week in nightclub history. Uh, my partner, Dennis DeGore, who created the concept and co-founders, Michael Simpkins and Mark Roberts, we set out to build a lifestyle brand and eight years ago till now, Super Bowl in Miami was our greatest week in history. And we anticipate F1 week topping that. I mean, and what you guys doing, are doing is incredible. A 24 hour nightclub, you have these, this incredible lineup of performers, but you're also the first nightclub to accept crypto as payment. Talk about why the brand entered the crypto space and how you hope to build on that with this Grand Prix event. Yeah, my partners and I are, are deep into the space uh, personally. And, you know, we thought it was time. Mayor Francis Suarez was champion, the tech movement here. And, you know, some people are calling Miami the, the crypto capital of the world right now. Uh, we, we have the International Bitcoin Conference here. And we decided to accept crypto just over a year ago. And it's been insane, the response. We've processed over $5 million in crypto. Um, and it's even led to us launching our own NFT collection, the 11 Captains Club, which we're minting at the end of the month. So it's exciting to even see this week uh, with Crypto.com being involved and FTX throwing events that people are actually paying, prepaying for our tables in crypto quite a bit. How much are they paying? We were reading over $100,000 for some tables. Is that accurate? It, it is. I mean, from last night through Sunday, they started at 5,000. Uh, we do sell the owner's table, uh, which is a whole branding package presented by 11 Vodka. And that is $100,000. That's already pretty much sold out for four nights, uh, one night available there. And then there's even some bigger sections 
from some of the corporate companies, watch companies and car companies that wanted to have 11 available just to send their biggest clients. So they took some big sections and spent even greater than 100,000. So then how fierce is the competition between the celebrity performers, you know, trying to get these big clients as well, especially when you have an entire city rallying around one big event? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's tough to navigate, believe it or not, because there's so many celebrities in town. Uh, we're getting calls from the PR agents that they want to stop by. And, you know, we have to navigate how many people we can let in along with the, the crazy crowd that's already here. I mean, Miami's expecting over 300,000 people and the stadium, Hard Rock Stadium, where the, they built the Miami International Auto Jerome for the race, really only holds 65,000. I think they built it up to 80,000. So that tells you about 75% of the people coming into Miami are here to party. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly are. I'm jealous of everyone that's down in Miami, including you right now, Gino. Give us a sense, because there was actually a piece in the Wall Street Journal this morning, and they were saying the spending that's happening right now on concerts, on people going out to eat, on people traveling, it's back to what it was in 2019, those pre-pandemic levels. Outside of a weekend like this, what are you seeing? Are, are, are more people going to your club than ever before? It's shocking, but coming out of COVID, it's actually increased quite a bit. Um, we were on a steady increase since, since opening in 2014, and 2019 was our best year prior to COVID. And coming out of it, it's been, you know, 40% better than 2019. So Miami is just on fire. Um, I, I, I believe it's happening in, in, in many cities, but Miami, I think, is just on another level. Sexy city with a lot of happenings um, and Zoom calls have just kind of changed the game. So a lot of northeastern influx of people moving here, Wall Street people, crypto, as you said, uh, it, it, it's been incredible. So then when you have so many people coming, because you're talking about sort of the international clients that are also coming, as well as the domestic clients who are, who are coming for these sorts of events, what does that really tell you about where you can go from here? I mean, who would have thought Formula One would be the thing that would draw everybody in? What are you thinking in terms of future collaborations or future events that you'd like to participate in? It's, a, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, we already have the famous Art Basel, our, our Miami Music Week, we're always the two biggest weeks. And of course, the typical New Year's and holidays. Then they added the International Bitcoin Conference last year, which grew tremendously this year. Now F1 signs a 10-year deal. And ironically, I feel like this F1 race may be the biggest one in history for first-time race goers. I've, I've personally never even been to F1 myself. Um, I've been watching that Drive to Survive show just so I could get a little bit of my own knowledge on it and understand the racers and so it, it's exciting and and i know miami you know the the political landscape here the 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 quality of the weather the beach um everybody rallies around trying to bring more events like this so i see more and more things coming to the city do you know are you going to the race this weekend i am going to the race i was a guest of uh, red bull executives so i'm excited because they own two cars so I'm pretty sure the area and the seats uh, will be pretty good and a lot of fun. It certainly sounds like that. Gina Lovinto, great to see you. Thanks so much and have a great weekend. Speaking of the workplace and some of the trends that we're seeing, working moms, they left their jobs in, jo in droves during the pandemic. And research shows that they are still struggling. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimates that a million women are still missing from the labor force compared to pre-pandemic levels. So here with more on this and to debunk some of the myths surrounding working moms, we want to bring in Katika Roy, a gender economist and also CEO of Pipeline. Katika, it's great to have you. Certainly some worrisome trends when it comes to working moms in the workplace. I know you have been looking into data surrounding this. What are you seeing? Well, what we're seeing, actually, we had some more women come back into the labor force. So uh, right now we have 873,000 uh, women that are still missing from the labor force since the beginning of the pandemic. And if you look at the last jobs report, uh, there is actually a gap. There are uh, 5.53 million 
people. And so if we brought more moms back to the labor force, we could actually close that gap by at least 16%. And Katika, the million dollar, billion dollar question here is how do we do that? What needs to be done? What do you think can be done in order to lure some of those women back into the workforce? Yeah, you know, it really comes down to busting the myths around working moms in the labor force. And there really are key, three key myths. Um, one is that women, uh, moms are less committed to their jobs than other workers. And what we know from research is that actually working moms are the most productive employees over the course of their career. The second is that moms can choose whether or not they work or the myth of secondary income, which is that mom's income is just for purses and shoes. We know that that's not true. 40% of US households actually rely on mom's income as the breadwinner mom. And then the last is that moms actually need to change their behavior in order to be treated equitably in the labor force. That's not true. What we need to do is actually ensure that workplaces value moms equitably. And Katika, when you take a look at the numbers, though, the pay differential, the pay gap is still pretty significant. And when you take a look at the numbers during the pandemic, it's pretty obvious that the pandemic stunted some of that progress towards gender equity. How much ground did we lose and how long will it take in order for us, do you think, to make up that ground? Yeah, so we lost, in terms of labor force participation, we actually lost 29 years. We're currently still set back to uh, 1993 in terms of labor force participation. And just to give you a sense of what that actually means in terms of dollars, uh, women uh, actually added $2 trillion to the US economy through their increased labor force participation since 1970. So we've lost a lot of that progress. I think the question in terms of how long will it take us to uh, bridge that gap and, and get back to where we were pri prior to the pandemic and then accelerate progress is really up to the decisions that we make. Are we committed to making the workplace more equitable? And are, will we prioritize equitable skilling to ensure that women have access to the future of work? Well, one thing that certainly is not equitable, and I was taking this from some of the notes that you have passed along, you said that women face a 4% drop in wages for every child that they have compared to men who get a 6% bump in pay for having children. I'm just back from maternity leave. I just had my <laughs> second child. So this one hit pretty close to home. Why do you think this is? I mean, I guess it's obvious because then people will say men work harder because they have a family to provide for. That's ex the same exact argument for women. That's exactly right, because we actually view women, working moms, as less committed to their jobs because they're moms. That's where that bias actually comes into play, and then we see it in wages. And then you couple that with the fact that breadwinner moms, so moms that earn the majority or all of the income in U.S. households with children under the age of 18, they have the largest gender pay gap of any moms in the labor force. It's actually 66 cents on the dollar. It's a huge gap and they're supporting 40% of our future labor force. So this is something, this is a gap that we really need to invest in closing and closing it now. And Katika, talk to us just about how childcare plays into this because that was one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons that women dropped out of the workforce during mm -hmm. the pandemic. Have we seen any real sense of improvement there? No. <laughs> That's the short answer. We haven't. We still, what we actually see, we you know, first of all, Congress hasn't passed any uh, of the American Families Plan that would invest in things like paid leave and child care. We have child care deserts where you can't actually access child care, as well as it's unaffordable for most American families. In addition to that, that being said, there are a lot of millions of working moms, 16 million to be exact, that can't actually leave the labor force uh, because of childcare issues. So we, we still need to solve for this, but also understand that it's not the only reason uh, the women left, that, that, that um, to bring women back into the labor force. Katika, are there certain companies, certain sectors, we talk about the tech sector who typically offers uh, great benefits to their employees. Any companies that are leading the way on this? 
That's a great question. I, you know, I don't uh, know of any that off the top of my head, mm -hmm. but what I will say is that companies who are investing in two things, one is equity of opportunity at work, as well as equitable skilling um, are the ones that will win. And let me just tell you a little bit, um, when we talk about equity of opportunity at work, what we're talking about is what Pipeline, the company that I run actually does, which is to ensure that the decisions that we're making about our employees, including working mothers, are in fact equitable. So for instance, before you make a pay decision or a performance deci re review decision or a promotion decision, that those are actually equitable. Extremely important topic. Katika Roy, CEO of Pipeline. Thanks so much for joining us.